Okay. So thank you to everyone for attending today's dual language, today's virtual roundtable discussion, advocating for dual language education programs. We are so pleased that so many responded to our invitation. My name is Phyllis Hardy and I am MABIS Executive Director. I'm also introducing you to MABIS board members who are me joining me in facilitating today's program. Aradhana Mudabi is our president and our conference co-chairs are Maria Luisa Di Stefano and Rabia Jos. For those new to MABE, MABE stands for Multi-State Association for Bilingual Education Northeast. We currently work in, with schools and districts in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Maine. We have invited you, key stakeholders in this region, to today's roundtable discussion to join us in support of our mission of promoting research-based dual language education programs that support bilingualism and multiculturalism for educational success. We believe that bilingualism and multiculturalism are assets that provide many advantages for all students, especially for our English learners and our emerging bilinguals. We are noticing that others are also embracing this vision as more are using the term multilingual learners in place of English learners. To help us with the logistics for this virtual event, we ask that you rename yourselves by adding the initials of the state that you work in after your name. By now, everyone has experienced Zoom meetings. You know to mute yourself or unmute yourself when you, are not, when you need to speak. Because so many are here today, we ask that you raise your hand virtually using one of the icons and the reaction buttons or use the chat to write out your questions. The goals of the roundtable discussion are to provide you with an opportunity to, gr to grow your understanding of the implications of the science of reading on dual language education programs, to deepen your knowledge of the intersection of assessment by literacy instruction, instructional materials and curriculum, curriculum instruction with science of reading mandates to avoid the misidentification of multilingual learners with disabilities, to be aware and mindful of the inappropriate use of monolingual literacy approaches in a dual language education context, and to protect and nurture dual language education programs in your district and state. By making connections and creating opportunities for collaboration among many stakeholders, we will be able to move forward together in creating the most equitable education and language learning programs for our students, especially those in underserved groups. In today's agenda, we will first listen about the research on the science of reading and the impact on dual language education. Dr. Patrick Proctor will be providing an overview of some of the overlaps and the disconnects between the ideologies and practices of the science of reading as compared with the ideologies, ideologies and practices of multilingual literacy. The goal of the presentation is to highlight the need to focus on multilingualism, not just in the rhetoric of the science of reading movement, but in the deeds of state and district policy, regulations and instructional practice. This focus on the deed will be explored in depth by our panelists today. We will listen to a panel of practitioners, district leaders, parents, and professors from teacher preparation programs in higher education. Describe the roadblocks they experience as a direct result of recent legislation and mandates required in their state regarding literacy. For emerging bilinguals and multilingual learners in dual language education programs, these new mandates are detrimentally affecting their access to bilingual programs, meaningful instruction, and well-prepared teachers. In the face of this increased focus on the science of reading, dual language practitioners across MABES member states are contending with a variety of additional challenges in ensuring that the new guidelines and mandates imposed are valid and instructionally sound for serving multilingual learners. We will then open the session to questions. We ask that you write the, in the chat questions you have as you listen to our keynote address and the panelists. 
you will have an opportunity to go into breakout rooms with others to process and discuss what you are learning today. And finally, using Padlet, we ask that each of you share one action you commit to doing in your sphere of influence that promotes sound research and practices in dual language education programs. Dr. Patrick Proctor is Professor of Education at Boston College and Chair of the Teaching, Curriculum, and Society Department at the Lynch School of Education and Human Development. He is a former third and fourth grade dual language teacher, bilingual research teacher, and an educational specialist at the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Patrick, I'm gonna stop sharing so you can share your screen. Thanks, Phyllis, and hello, everybody. It's great to see so many uh, faces uh, attending this event today. I'm going to share my screen. There we go. OK. Can people see this? Yes. Excellent. So thanks again for having me, Phyllis. Um, so I was given the title of this talk, and thanks to Phyllis and to Rebecca Westlake and, and all of the other um, Mabe folks for putting this on. It's quite an impressive event. Um, I was given this title, the Science of Reading for Multilingual Learners, and I, and I stuck with it because I think it's, it's totally accurate, but I did add a parenthetic question mark at the end um, because for two reasons. One, I think we all need to sort of ask ourselves, what does that mean? And secondly, to sort of underscore the fact that what I'm going to say to you is a lot of what I think and what I've seen, and I'm not suggesting to you that everything I'm saying is going to be a fact. Um, but it is a set of concerns and a, and a set of sort of common ground, I think, that we have between multilingual literacy perspectives and the science of reading. So getting right into it, I want to just start by uh, doing a little land acknowledgement that I hope is not too performative, but um, knowledge that we I'm coming from to you from the eastern part of the state called Massachusetts, which is Algonquin land. Historically, for 12,000 years, Algonquin nations and tribes have lived on this land, uh, and we, I, actively occupy and benefit from that land. Um, so in honor of this talk, I made a donation to the Wopanak Language Reclamation Project, which is uh, an organization in Mashpee, Massachusetts, and on the island of Nope, which is also referred to as Martha's Vineyard, um, as a project designed to reclaim, revitalize the Wampanoag language, which was largely um, extinguished over centuries of colonization. So now there is an effort using colonial documents written in Wampanoag to revitalize the language. Um, so it's a sort of a beautiful, hopeful, painful project that you can donate to also if you feel so inclined, or you could watch the movie that is the origin story of that of that. Um, project called We Still Live Here, and you can purchase that uh, from Make Peace Productions, and proceeds also go to support that organization. Uh, quickly, a brief language and literacy story from me so you know who's talking to you. Um, I am from Hartford, Connecticut, uh, so this Mabe conference is particularly salient to me. I grew up uh, going to the Hartford Public Schools. It's where I learned Spanish, uh, both in the classroom and outside of the classroom in the hallways of schools. Um, at that time when I was going through, I won't tell you what year it was, but the Hartford Public Schools were uh, around 43% Puerto Rican and Dominican, so Spanish was everywhere. Um, I spent time in Puerto Rico and Sevilla, España, sort of learning Spanish um, more naturalistically. Uh, once I got out of college and my master's program, I was, a, as Phyllis said, a third and fourth grade teacher in the Detroit Public Schools. Uh, I was a elementary, I was at the Mass. Department of Education before they were called DESI, and a bilingual resource teacher in Waltham. From there, I went and got my doctorate. And my plan was to get a doctorate and go back to Waltham and be the bilingual director there. But right in the middle of it, English for the Children hit Massachusetts and they made bilingual education illegal. So it completely changed my trajectory and I was fortunate enough to um, move into research where I sort of dedicated myself to thinking about how can we develop more holistic models of, um, of reading for bilingual kids, because all I was seeing was English only models in the research. And then along came English for the children and sort of verified that concern. Um, since then, I've been working in other countries around, around uh, in Chile, most recently in Santiago de Chile, I've been working with 
uh, doctoral students around second language learning and bilingualism there, where they have a growing Haitian Creole population, um, which is super interesting. So that's me, but all of us as multilingual people have our own language and literacy stories. Uh, so I sort of encourage y'all to think about what is yours. Uh, and if you're teachers, I encourage you to work with your students to think about what are theirs. Um, so to start, I, I wanted to start with an old um, clip. I'm not going to show the video, uh, but this PowerPoint is hyperlinked. I'm going to share the PowerPoint with everybody in the chat when I'm done so you can see it. Um, this is an old clip from a uh, TV show, The Dick Cavett Show in 1969, who was, he was having James Baldwin on to discuss issues of race and oppression in the United States, particularly for Black people. Uh, and in the middle of it, he brings on, Dick Cavett brings on this white man philosopher from Yale to talk to James Baldwin about the fact, basically, that uh, James Baldwin proves that all you have to do in this country is work hard, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and be talented. And you too can elevate yourself to the uh, status of elite author like James Baldwin. And James Baldwin takes great offense to this comment. And if you, um, if you go to minute 10, 15 in this video, uh, you'll see what he says. And he says, look, I don't know if the Board of Education hates black people, but I know the textbooks they give my children to read and the schools that we have to go to. And then he moves into the crux of this talk for me and, and for a lot of the ways I've been thinking about this, you want me to make an act of faith on some idealism, which you assure me exists, but which I have never seen. So in other words, James Baldwin was saying, I believe the evidence that I see, and I need to look at that more than I need to believe what I hear, the rhetoric. Uh, so Phyllis sort of uh, alluded to this in her introduction. Uh, and that's what I want to sort of focus on. That's the through line here that I want to sort of think about with you all. Um, so the will for the deed. So this is some of the deeds in my, in my sort of historical view of the science of reading. Some of the deeds are the simple view of reading. So if you're an advocate of the science of reading, you definitely know the simple view of reading, which is this idea that reading comprehension is decoding times language comprehension. I did my whole dissertation on the simple view of reading and trying to adapt it for bilingual learners. Um, I think it's a useful framework, actually. I found it very uh, informative and, and, and it's a good entree into thinking about some of these things. Another deed of the science of reading is Scarborough's reading rope, which you see everywhere now. All that is, is the simple view of reading put into a more um, packageable visual developmental perspective such that decoding should get more automatic over time uh, and language comprehension should become increasingly strategic over time. So you devote more cognitive energy to the strategy as your decoding gets better. Uh, another gigantic deed of the science of reading is the National Reading Panel's 2000 report of the big five, phonics, phonemic awareness, fluency, vocabulary, reading strategies. Those are everywhere today. It is essentially, as far as I can tell, it is the Bible of the science of reading movement. Um, and it influences a lot of the rubrics that you see even today um, in these new science of reading legislation uh, and policies. Reading first was another deed of the science of reading. Uh, and there's a whole history on that. There's a brand new podcast out of Have You Heard? I've linked to it in this, um, in this presentation also that you can listen to about that. Um, lastly, on the National Reading Panel, one thing that disturbs me a little bit is that all of that research came from the 20th century, first of all. And secondly, a, a lot of that research, as you can see in the little clip below, excluded bilingual learners from the studies themselves. So the conclusions that are drawn are drawn in large measure from studies that actually didn't include the students that we care most about uh, here at Mabe. Um, a, a multilingual perspective on reading. Uh, incorporates some of that, but also has some distinctions. So, and this is just sort of the way I've been understanding this. There's a lot of multilingualists in the room who might add or edit what I have here, but a multilingual perspective understands that reading is a complex act and requires foundational skills that are explicit and systematically taught. It recognizes that language is just as foundational and is best represented as a fluid construct per the simple view that interacts with those foundational skills. You can't understand decoding without understanding language. 
further believes that reading research and practice should be tightly aligned and informed by methodologically diverse and rigorous studies, and advocates, as Phyllis also said, that the home languages of children and youth are critical for teaching and learning and need to be part of the design of reading research and reading practice. So common ground, I made a little Venn diagram a ways back. And so that's sort of been grounding um, the thinking of this talk. De common ground, I think, between science of reading and, and um, multilingual literacy is decoding metalinguistics and talk. Um, so student, whoops, decoding. Systematic phonics is important. Uh, reading in Creole, Pinyin, Spanish, other languages that employ the same alphabet are perfect points of overlap and, and instruction. In Spanish, syllabic instruction is also good. Um, ma, me, mi, mo, mu, uh, or this is harder for me, fa, ma, la, sa, ba, that's more phonemic. But you see different ways of, of thinking about sort of decoding instruction, but it's always best when integrated into a full literacy program. English phonics approaches though, are not always the best way for thinking about decoding instruction. Claude Goldenberg's work has been very instructive in that uh, pushing that fact home. And again, decoding interacts with language per the simple view. And that has to be kept in mind as we think about all the trainings and things that we're having folks go through, for example, letters, which does not focus on multilingualism to any significant extent. And finally, multiple cueing strategies for word reading really is not an effective way to teach children to decode. If you took one thing away from that Sold a Story podcast, it's that. Um, I don't know that we needed six episodes, uh, but it was an important message to send home that that asking kids to look at pictures to decode words is something they might be inclined to do, but it's better if we teach them to sound the words out and make sense of words that way. Um, Metalinguistic awareness, I think a lot of folks agree with this. So metalinguistic awareness is useful because one way to get at it is to break language into its component parts phonology, morphology, syntax, vocabulary, when we, those are instructionally malleable things we can teach. It doesn't, it shouldn't just be vocabulary, right? It should be these other domains of language. We can teach kids about them. And in doing so, uh, we ask them to reflect on how language works, how, what it does, what it works for. Um, and the, and students test performances on these skills predict reading comprehension. It's not just vocabulary. These other things predict also above and beyond decoding skill. And then when you add bridging to it, you get kids opportunities to compare and contrast how these different constructs of language work in different languages. So cognates in Spanish and English, or the verb or the adjectives comes before the noun in English, but after the noun in Spanish, uh, things like that. So there's some agreement here around metalinguistic awareness. And finally, student talk. I think we all agree that student talk is important. Uh, Catherine Snow puts it rather simply, in order to develop language, you have to use language. You know, learn to talk by, get better at talk by talking. Um, and dialogic classrooms, talk-based instruction shows associations with lots of different kinds of outcomes for kids. Engagement and cognitive processing, reading comprehension, self-perception and agency, ideation and writing. There's a whole host of, um, of outcomes that extend beyond basic literacy and, and create senses of belonging and agency in kids when you allow kids to talk in the classroom about the things that they're learning. But there are also important distinctions between the science of reading and multilingual literacy around theory, research, representation, and language more generally. So there are distinct theoretical foundations. The science of reading primary theoretical orientations are the simple view of reading and Scarborough's reading rope. That's Those are the ones I hear about when I look on Twitter. Everyone says, I think we all fully accept the reading rope. And, you know, th that's true. But both of those theories are silent on multilingualism. They talk about language, but sort of parenthetically, the default assumption is English language. My colleague, Mariela Paez, always says that when people say language, she says, which language? Because she wants us to think more about, you know, when we talk about language comprehension, what language are we talking about comprehending? It's a very important thing to think about. Whereas with multilingual literacy, its sort of theoretical traditions are entirely grounded in thinking about different languages and how they interact with each other. Even if you're taking this old, if you look at the top, autonomous view of linguistic systems, 
this is not right, but it's still thinking about two language systems. And then we move to linguistic interdependence from Jim Cummins, uh, which seeks to think about how two different languages interact with each other cognitively, down to translanguaging, where we're drawing on a full linguistic repertoire that we have access to at all times, depending on who we're talking to. So multilingual literacy theory recognizes multilingualism as the, as the basis for um, for theorizing and thinking. There's also distinct orientations to research. Science of reading, heavily quantitative. It's grounded in exploratory and confirmatory research. This is good. It tends to be correlational and developmental, and it tends to privilege also randomized control trials and quasi-experiments. I've contributed a lot of these kinds of studies um, to the research literature on, on reading. I think they're, they're useful. And they're very much privileged in federal research funding schemes. Uh, however, these approaches can't really manage multilingual theory very well because they separate the languages and so they become monolingual by design. I will make a distinction though, conceptual vocabulary research is a kind of a promising area. My colleague Jeanette Mancia Martinez at Vanderbilt does a lot of this where she is trying to think about this common underlying proficiency using quantitative measures. Multilingual literacy research is more methodologically mixed. Like SOR, it's grounded in exploratory and confirmatory research, occasionally uses correlational, developmental, randomized control trials, et cetera, but it also uses qualitative research methods, case studies, discourse analysis, ethnographies, portraiture. These are uh, methodologies that are not privileged in federal research spheres and thus don't get as much funding and recognition and dissemination at the federal level uh, as science of reading research does. Uh, and multilingual literacy research manages theory through these methodologies, because if you have more methodologies, you can address a more rigorous theory better. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, people doing this kind of work, uh, sorry, um, who I can't read because my screen is, but Deb Palmer, uh, Jeanette Mutchstein Martinez, Patreon Smith, a lot of people are doing this kind of work. Um, that's very impressive. There's also distinctions in representation. So multilingual literacy researchers tend to be much more representative of the populations that they're studying. So that's more of an emic, you get a more, much more of a from within an empathic perspective on what's going on. Science of reading researchers historically have tended to be white and monolingual. However, it's diversifying in recent years. Sonia Cabell, Nicole Patton-Terry, Jeanette Monsignor Martinez, Julie Washington, um, are sort of are leading a, a new wave of, of research and representation in science of reading, which I very much appreciate um, those perspectives. Uh, finally, distinctive views of language and languaging. So I, I'm bringing in Ocean Wong here. I don't know if anyone knows who he is, but uh, he grew up in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, so I kind of feel a kindred spirit with him in a certain way, especially be, given his views on language. Um, he's a poet and author. He wrote a book called On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous. He's a MacArthur Genius Fellow, and he is indeed a genius. Uh, I recommend listening to this podcast, On Being, where he's interviewed. It's uh, an amazingly beautiful interview, and his, pers his perspectives on language are very important and relevant to multilingual literacy theory. And he says in that podcast, we're taught, particularly in elementary school, to learn a standardized language. And when you ask, why is it this way? Why is this the standard? you arrive at a very arbitrary answer, which actually excludes often people of color. Your English is wrong, this English is right. So he's making this distinction, he's thinking sort of translinguistically, what's the full linguistic repertoire that we all have versus what is the repertoire that's expected at school? Um, and that view is very much in line with multilingual literacy research and practice. SOR views of language tend to reflect more standardized monolingualism, because language is psychologically measured for the, for the purposes of correlational experimental research. So you get English reading, vocabulary, decoding, syntax, and then Spanish reading, decoding, vocabulary, syntax, or other languages. Uh, and the assessments that are used mark the type of language that is valued and expected and, and looked to for performance. So there's distinctions about what do we even think about when we think about language as a noun, and do we use language as a verb to language? So critical question and reframing. So my question always is, what is the work that that word science is doing in the science of reading? There's a good article by McPhee et al. Um, 
in Reading Research Quarterly that gets at this, particularly in the popular media. That's where I see it the most. But this idea that science is objective and science is authoritative and science is quantification, science is solution. Most fr frustrating for me is science as binary. So either something scientific or it is not scientific. And you're starting to see these, these frames, these binary frames show up in legislation. The Virginia Literacy Act, for example, codifies practices as either scientific or not. Uh, and that is problematic because it's not binary. So a reframing uh, from the science of reading to what to me it represents more of a psychological science of monolingual reading. That's not as catchy. So, but that's what I see when I look at the literature and the science of reading and what's cited and who's cited and how often it's much more psychologically oriented. It's much more monolingual. Um, and so it's a specific kind of science of reading that I think we're seeing move across legislative spheres uh, in the country. So takeaways, four takeaways, and then I'll hand it over to my colleagues. The science of reading is here, so we can criticize it all we want, but it's here, or better said, I think it's back as a matter of policy. Um, so it's critical for all of us to be monitoring causal outcomes. Like, do these legislative changes make differences in the outcomes that people claim that they're going to make? Our panelists today are going to talk about that, but we've been here before with George Bush and Reading First, and we have uh, a, an evaluation report from Gamsey, um, and then this podcast, Have You Heard, really goes back and unpacks that and tries to think about having been here before. Um, don't take the will for the deed. So back to Baldwin, saying that language matters is not enough. What is the observable evidence that we see in, in state and dis district policies uh, and Department of Ed regulations and approved literacy curricula and teacher education. So it's a way to think about sort of to evaluate, but it also means we have to live this in our own planning. So as Paolo Freire says, like, how do we walk the talk? So we say things too. So I say that I think about this to myself all the time. I say these things, what do I do? What am I doing? Uh, our buy in multilingualism and representation being designed into teacher licensure and endorsement regulations? Or are we just preparing teachers for English only? What are high quality instructional materials? Is bilingualism an instructional add on? Uh, are texts that are in these curricula representative of the kids who are going to be using them? And with state and district assessments, monolingual assessments, Phyllis said it at the beginning, that for bilingual programs are a setup for perceived failures. You can't. You can't you can't just use English to, to measure the effectiveness of a bilingual program. That does not make sense. That's not how it's designed. So that needs to be addressed. And finally, joy matters. I believe this very strongly. And I hear, I've heard too much uh, in science of reading spheres that joy can wait or love of reading can wait. Kids have to learn to decode first. That I, I completely reject this idea. And I am not a fan of Lucy Calkins. But I am a fan of Goldie Muhammad, who has a whole framework for thinking about infusing joy uh, and recasting instruction to center um, blackness and linguistic diversity as a matter of instruction and as a matter of joy and belonging and agency for kids. Um, so I'm going to stop there and say thank you um, and stop my share and turn it over to my colleagues. Okay, um, thank you, Patrick. So in the face of this increased focus on the science of reading, dual language practitioners across MaBase member states are contending with a variety of additional challenges in ensuring that the new guidelines and mandates imposed are valid and instructionally sound for serving multil multilingual learners. In Massachusetts, districts are required to use a universal screener with students K-2 to identify students who may be at risk of dyslexia or other reading disabilities. Although available in multiple, in multiple languages, there are no specific, I apologize, I lost my place. <laughs> although, although the state guidance encourages districts to use screeners that are valid, reliable, and available in multiple languages, there are no specific regulations as to when to use a screener in a non-English language or for which students. Within the requirements, a district may screen all students in English, regardless of home language, leading to over-identification of multilingual learners and over-referral to interventions. 
This past year in Connecticut, there have been significant implications for pre-service and in-service teacher preparation, as districts are required to adopt and train all teachers in specific practices related to science of reading programs. The Rhode Island Right to Read Act passed in 2019 requires educators to exhibit either proficiency in or awareness of the knowledge and practices of the science of reading and structured literacy. Local education agencies, LEAs, must provide professional learning for educators to support these requirements. And educator preparation programs must address these requirements within their programs of study. We are going to hear from three school and district leaders. First, we have Amy Finsmith, Supervisor of Multilingual Education at Wyndham Public Schools in Connecticut and the parent of formal, former dual language students. Then we have Amanda Campbell, the De Deputy Director of Multilingual Education at Lynn Public Schools in Massachusetts. And lastly, we're, we'll hear from Julie Nora, the Director of the International Charter School in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. The first question is, how is the science of reading impacting the dual language education programs in your district? Amy, could you please talk to us about Wyndham Public Schools in Connecticut? Remembering to unmute. Yes, thanks, Aradna. In Wyndham, almost half of our kindergarten classrooms are dual language classrooms. We have two dual language programs, Compañeros, a pre-K through eighth grade lottery-based two-way immersion program, and Dos Rios, a K-6 one-way developmental dual language program that serves as our district's mandated bilingual program for eligible multilingual learners. Both programs are 50-50 and students learn to read in both Spanish and English simultaneously. When 45% of our district's kindergartners are learning to read in two languages, regulations and legislation regarding reading have the potential to impact positively or negatively the success of our students. Connecticut's right to read legislation was passed in June of 2021. It includes several requirements. From what we have experienced, the impact on our programs and students is greatly dependent on the working definition of science of reading. When science of reading is narrowly defined and interpreted to mean a strong emphasis on decontextualized decoding through synthetic phonics, especially in the early grades, our students suffer. An example of where this definition has impacted our programs is the recent removal of our current literacy benchmark assessment system from the approved assessments. This has forced us to switch or add on an additional approved assessment for our students. If these assessments, which of course must be in English, are then also used as high stakes ass assessments, for example, determining which students will be re required to go to summer school, this further impacts our students. It also puts unnecessary pressure on teachers to teach isolated decoding skills in English and further reinforces the message that English is the language that matters despite our attempts to elevate the status of Spanish. One example of something our state is getting right or closer to right is a master class they're offering in the science of reading designed for district teams. Each session starts with a professional learning session by a national presenter. Although the lens of multilingual learners is often lacking or offered a cursory mention, the presentations have been really about the science, which often includes practices that are also best practices for multilingual learners. During the phonics presentation, there was no push for decontextualized phonics that is so often seen as synonymous with science of reading. In the afternoon, district cohorts work on a district literacy plan that is tailored to and designed by our district. This means that there is room for strategies and action steps that take into account our dual language students' literacy development. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Julie, could you please tell us about how the science of reading is impacting the International Charter School at, in Pawtucket, Rhode Island? <clears throat> yes, good morning. So I'm the director of the International Charter School uh, in Pawtucket. We have two 50-50 dual language programs, a Spanish English and a Portuguese English strand. Um, as you just said, the legislation for science of reading in Rhode Island is called the Right to Read Act. And I see the need to support 
and um, the need for teachers to increase their capacity in teaching reading. Um, however, um, as Patrick said, we need to make sure that we're doing this in ways that meet the needs of language learners and their teachers. Um, none of the current 24 courses that are offered for the science of reading were designed to teach how to um, read in a dual language setting, as we know, which requires unique considerations. All of them um, have a significant number of hours of coursework and a good number of dual language educators are emergency certified and are therefore taking other courses towards their certification. So it's a lot to ask when it may not be the right fit. Uh, the requirements also coincide with a constellation of adopting um, high quality curricula in literacy and in math. So we're spending a good amount of time figuring out how to teach the high quality curricula in two languages since they weren't designed for dual language programs. And they all have a significant time requirement that is part of what made them high quality, quote unquote. Um, we've adopted math and literacy high quality curricula in Spanish and English for that strand because they were on the approved list but we've only um, adopted the literacy and math in English for our Portuguese strand because there were none that were approved that are available in Portuguese. So this is a threat to that program and is requiring that teachers and administrators for that strand spend a lot of additional time developing materials. Um, teachers are getting familiar with and trying to figure out how to teach the new high quality curriculum at the same time that they're being required to take the science of reading coursework, which isn't necessarily designed for dual language learners and maybe in a language that they don't completely dominate English in <clears throat> academically. So we have not moved forward with the science of reading requirements yet um, because of <clears throat> the constellation of requirements, um, because as many people on this Zoom know, we also have a shortage of bilingual educators and we need to do what we can to help them feel successful um, and not overwhelmed. Thanks, Julie. Amanda, could you please tell us about Lynn, Massachusetts? Sure, hi everyone. Um, so here in Lynn, 67% of our students in pre-K through second grade are identified English learners. Over 80% of our students speak a language other than English at home. And we have two Spanish English dual language programs where students spend 90% of their kindergarten day in Spanish. Um, one way that Lynn has been impacted is by the Massachusetts requirements to implement early literacy and universal screeners. Um, although well-intentioned, the guidance has been unclear, and this really has negatively impacted our multilingual learners. Although, as um, Aradha mentioned in her intro, although it's recommended that we test in a child's first language, it doesn't specify how we do this or even require us to do it. Um, and this is even trickier in dual language where there are two different languages of instruction and 100% of students are emerging bilinguals in one or both languages. Um, and again, without clear guidance that's rooted in bilingual research, districts are left to determine how we're gonna implement this on our own with our multilingual learners. When the assessments are done in um, monolingually, teachers are left without clear actionable biliteracy data and programs do not have information to evaluate our program's success. Um, another impact has been the overemphasis on discrete skills like phonics and phonemic awareness. These two things both look very different in a transparent language like Spanish um, as compared to what they look like in English. And so here in Lynn, we spent a lot of time making what we call the what plays nice with dual language chart. Um, we went through each aspect of literacy instruction. We went through all the district and state initiatives to determine what does and does not work in the context of dual language. Um, again, this was a district um, developed process um, and without putting in the work up front as a district, our dual language programs would have spent way too much time doing things that are unnecessary in Spanish simply because it was required for English only programming. Thank you. Our second question is, how can we work within the confines of what has already been said by legislation? Julie, could you please go first? Yes. So um, in Rhode Island, um, 
the General Assembly passed uh, a substitute resolution in June 2022. And with this legislation, Ride is um, collecting uh, public feedback and has delayed the uh, date of the requirements for the Right to Read Act, um, actually through the end of March. So <clears throat> this offers, I think there's recognition that the coursework is significant. I don't think it was done actually for the purposes of multilingual learners, but it does offer us an opportunity with conversations like today uh, to inform um, how we go forward. They also dropped the science of reading course requirements for Spanish side teachers who may not be academically proficient in English and the courses aren't adequate. This came from advocacy that I um, made with them. And I am grateful for that because it's a lot of time to spend on something that might be really difficult and also not appropriate. But we also, as I said at the beginning of my previous comments, want to make sure that we are providing Spanish side, Portuguese side teachers with appropriate learning to be able to teach reading. So I don't want to just ignore that. Um, the literacy curriculum that we adopted has a really strong, um, it builds background knowledge in a significant way, which many of our learners need. So I'm very, um, Patrick talked a little bit about if it's culturally relevant and um, I believe it is, and it also builds background knowledge. We need to figure out how to teach literacy in two languages, um, both the teacher understanding side, but also the curriculum itself when there are these significant time requirements um, and to make sure that we're building in supports for language learning. Um, we need to make sure we have opportunities for educators to teach reading in dual language settings. Um, a lot of schools and districts are experiencing the same thing right now, uh, dual language schools. And so this is um, unfortunate in a way that we're, this is dropped on us and we have to figure it out. But I guess the, the possibility is that we can all learn together and share what we're doing. Um, and like students, um, and, and this gets to the James Baldwin quote, I believe that Patrick said, but we need to be critical of these initiatives as they're coming down under terms like science and high quality uh, and make sure that we're advocating and critical consumers of both of these. Thank you, Julie. Um, Amanda, what are your thoughts on this? Um, so from my perspective, we really need to rethink our stance on the prevalence of English dominance. Um, many recent initiatives, especially from my own experience in Massachusetts, um, such as mass literacy, and as I mentioned earlier, the universal screener, early literacy screener, they all presume English literacy at the start. And especially in 90-10 programs or even 50-50 programs, that's not the case. Um, they have little to no reference to multilingual learners or to dual language and students developing biliteracy. Um, in order to do this, we really need to commit to who we're centering in our decision making. And most importantly, who's at the table when we're making these types of decisions. We have to ensure that all decision makers, state, district, and school-based leaders, our coaches, um, that they understand what it means to be bilingual, what it means to be multilingual, um, how students navigate language and literacy, especially when learning to integrate both languages. Um, we have bilingual programs. We have students developing literacy in more than one language. Across the state, we have students that speak more than one language, and we have teachers that teach literacy in many, many different languages. So we really do have to focus on the science of bilingual and multilingual reading, the research base of bilingual and multilingual reading, not just the science of monolingual English reading. Thank you. Amy? Um, so the question is, how do we work with what's what we already have? Um, I think the key is that we have to partner as often as possible. We need a voice. We need a seat at the table. Looking at the list of people serving on Connecticut's Reading Leadership Implementation Council, we don't have a seat at the table. There is no expert on multilingual learners or multilingual learner literacy. However, there have been instances in Connecticut where we have had a chance to have a voice. One example was in the selection of allowable reading programs. Districts were able to submit a program for review. Our district has been <clears throat> a reading program that we intentionally selected 
for its commitment to offering students mirrors and windows and intentional inclusion of authors and characters who are typically underrepresented. This program does not use a decontextualized synthetic, synthetic phonics approach often seen in some of the other programs. I suspect that this program would not have made the list if we as a district had not been able to present evidence that it does in fact meet the requirement of being supported by science of reading or science of monolingual reading research and that we need to have a high quality program in Spanish as well as in English in our district. One thing that we can do is advocate the best we can, even when we don't have time for traditional advocacy efforts. States can help multilingual learners by providing opportunities for experts in literacy education for multilingual learners to enhance the research base the state is using to make decisions. At a district level, it is essential that we stay on top of and sometimes create opportunities to share our experiences and those of our students to voice our needs and those of our students in programs. Thanks, Amy. So thank you, Amy, Julie, and Amanda. Next, we're gonna hear from two parents of dual language students. We are lucky to be joined by two parents of dual language students. Isaka Axelrod lives in a bilingual household and is the parent of children currently in dual language education programs. She is a former early childhood teacher and currently a professor. Patricia Santos is the parent of a former dual language student and is currently a Portuguese English teacher at a dual language school. We are very fortunate to have these two parents sharing their experiences from Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Our question for both of y'all is, what is the most pressing challenge or need that y'all have encountered in your experience having your children at DL program, uh, dual language programs? Patricia, will you answer first, please? Yes, of course. Um, as, a as a proud multilanguage mother of a multilanguage student, I was apprehensive about enrolling my child in one of the typical uh, English language learning programs because they only existed, or I mean, assisted students with transitioning from their native language, in this case, it would be Portuguese, to English. I wanted to educate my child to be bilingual and biliterate since I believe that more language a person knows, the more opportunities they will have. Then while attending the National Charter School in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, um, which provides uh, a dual language education, Carolina, my daughter, had the opportunity to obtain the best education across courses in both languages, Portuguese and English. As she progressed through her bilingual uh, education journey, her reading and writing abilities in both languages increased substantially, becoming bilingual and biliterate, biliterate uh, at the end of fifth grade. We didn't have the opportunity to continue in middle school or even now in high school. However, only a few multilanguage students are as fortunate as her, putting this case, my daughter, in a privileged position. The most significant obstacle to this understanding has been and continues to be the US society and government's disbelief in the advantages of bilingual and dual language education, putting obstacles to it by creating not equitable policies. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. And Isaka, how about you? Thank you. So my name is Isaka, and I'm the parent of three young emergent bilingual children who attend a Holyoke Public School dual language program. I'm multilingual, was raised in a multilingual home. I'm a former kindergarten teacher in both bilingual and monolingual settings, and I'm currently an associate professor of early childhood ed at UMass Amherst, and I teach courses in early literacy. I share all of this as a way to provide some perspective on the lenses and privileges that I bring to this conversation and the way that all of these experiences and identities shape my position on the issues we're discussing and of course impact the way in which I view my own children's education and experiences in school. Play should be a cornerstone of early childhood education, which goes all the way up to second grade. And for the past few decades, we've seen it leaving early childhood classrooms in favor of more teacher-directed and rigid curricula across all academic areas. 
I see the shift away from play, away from understandings of early childhood and who young children are, impacting early literacy guidelines that build on rigid understandings of language, which frequently ignore emergent bilinguals and focus exclusively on English, fixed views of English, a lack of understanding of translanguaging as a language practices that all emergent bilinguals engage in, and a lack of understanding of language development and the playful ways in which young children, monolingual, bilingual, multilingual, all children, make sense of the language practices in their communities and learn to navigate and negotiate languages across contexts. And all of this narrowness impacts how reading and writing are being taught in schools. As a parent, I see this in my children's education, and I want to be very clear that this is not a critique of their teachers or schools. They're wonderful. However, the curricular mandates reinforce a separation of languages in spite of the teachers knowing and recognizing trend languaging and understanding it as a pedagogical approach. And giving the increased focus on science of reading, their narrowing understanding of language practices and the practices of multilingual children. This perspective perpetuates a de deficit view of the language practices of emergent bilinguals. And instead of building on what we know, what the research says, as Patrick shared, about language as a social practice, it reinforces the dominance of English and one way of using English. Additionally, the narrow focus on reading has almost completely pushed writing off of the schedule. And there's little time for, and what little time there is for writing now focuses on handwriting and spelling, which leaves no time for young children to playfully engage with composing practices. Children are not having opportunities to learn um, how to, in ways that are developmentally appropriate, um, learn how to write. And this fixation on spelling and handwriting ignores the multimodality of the writing practices of young children that includes drawing, gestures, oral, stella, oral storytelling that together help children express themselves, their ideas, and their stories, which is what writing should be about. My biggest concern in this movement towards only including the science of reading and literacy instruction in schools is what's left out, what is ignored, um, that is essential to how young children learn language and literacy practices. And absolutely, we want teachers to meet the needs of all learners and to have the tools to do so in skilled ways. But to do so, we must build on research that is inclusive and values diversity of language and literacy practices, particularly for emergent bilinguals. Thank you, Isaka. Now let's hear from two university professors in teacher preparation programs. We are fortunate to be joined by Dr. Laura Reynolds, professor at the Graduate Reading Program at Southern Connecticut State University, and Dr. Terry Deeney, professor of Reading, Language, and Disabilities from the University of Rhode Island. The first question is, how does legislation in your state impact the way you support the development of pre-service and in-service multilingual, multilingual literacy teachers, specifically those working in dual language programs? Dr. Reynolds, can you answer this first about your work at Southern Connecticut State? Good morning, I'd be happy to. Uh, legislation in Connecticut requires that the preparation of our bilingual education candidates include what is called the science of reading. This legislation's teeth is that candidates must pass a new version of the high stakes foundations of reading test, which aligns with the legislation's demands in order to receive Connecticut certification. All the constraints of previous higher education legislation including the 120 credit limitation for a four-year degree and the need for a 39 credit second major only leaves room for two reading courses. And these must be tailored so that students can pass that all important foundations of reading test or the candidate will not receive Connecticut certification. This being said, there is very little time to teach our bilingual education candidates native language literacy pedagogy nor is there time to learn about the adaptations to structured literacy needed when multilingual learners begin to read in English. Our bilingual candidates need more time to learn multilingual reading pedagogy, but only receive a limited amount of English reading instruction. Because of the state's mandates, the one size fits all monolingual English approach to reading can really do more harm um, than good to our multilingual students. Structured literacy emphasizes English phonics first in early reading, not recognizing how other language systems contribute to accurate decoding. For example, a child whose English syntax is still developing will read the sentence, the boy runs as the boy run. This is not a phonics error. 
but entirely predictable when the teacher takes into consideration the English syntax development of the child. A small increase in the number of these so-called errors can make the difference between whether or not a child is given access to more complex text or is given watered down non-academic text. I believe this lack of knowledge is one of the many issues that contribute to Connecticut's over-identification of multilingual children in special education. Thank you. Dr. Dini, how about your work with pre-service and in-service teachers of multilingual literacy at the University of Rhode Island? Thanks for having me. Um, Rhode Island's Right to Read Act mandates, as you've heard already, that the teacher preparation ensures that pre-service elementary teachers are proficient in the science of reading and structured literacy, which is basically explicit instruction in English phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. In our pre-service elementary education program, we do have three courses in literacy, so we can meet the requirements in English. But most of our pre-service teachers are white and monolingual. So without a class designed around language and literacy learning in MLLs, we don't have the time in these introductory courses to cover not only the many facets of English literacy, but also the nuances of how the rules and structures of English differ from those of other languages. We can minimally ensure that our students understand there are differences and that those differences will show up very predictably in multilingual learner development of English literacy. That way, I mean, I hope we can guard against our students translating difference to deficit. And I usually share this anecdote and ask my students whether they would be able to help this child. I was asked to consult to an ESL at-risk classroom of first graders. One child was completing a math problem of five plus four and her friend was helping. And the child had written the incorrect number. The friend told him nueve. When the child again wrote a wrong answer, the friend pointed and said novi. When the child again wrote the wrong answer, the friend erased it for him and said nine, showing him how to write the number. I asked the child how he knew how to help his friend, and he told me first he tried Spanish and that didn't work, and then he tried Portuguese and that didn't work, and then he tried English. So not only did he know the languages, he also knew how to switch between them to meet his needs. So I asked how a six, I asked my students how a six-year-old speaking not one, not two, but three languages could ever be a deficit or place him at risk. So I can't, don't have time to teach my students the ins and outs of dual language education, but I can start the conversation. I just can't extend it. Thank you. Our last question for our professors is how can we work within the confines of what has already been said by legislation? Dr. Reynolds? How can we work within the constraints of Connecticut legislation to provide equitable education for multilingual and multidialectal students? I don't see how we can begin to do this in undergraduate teacher preparation programs, unless there's a significant revision of state undergraduate requirements. Time is needed to learn deeply about the needs of all students, not just those students with dyslexia. And that time is simply not present in the undergraduate bilingual teacher preparation programs. Thank you. Um, thank y'all and thanks to all of our panelists for sharing y'all's experiences from your respective vantage points. Now the audience will have the opportunity- uh, Aradana, to sorry for interrupting. Uh, we wanted to hear from uh, Terry Dini as well. Oh, I apologize. Sorry. <laughs> Dr. Dini, could you share your thoughts? No worries at all. Uh, the legislation addressing the science of reading specifically addresses the contribution of cognitive science. It's literally written into the legislation, um, and that's conducted in English, as Dr. Proctor said, right? This English research informs the teaching of English reading, but we have other research that informs literacy teaching. So focusing on the science of reading necessitates that we focus on science says, plural. For example, we know from cognitive social cultural research that the critical role that child and family funds of knowledge play in learning. We have decades of research in psychology showing that deficit views of children and families lead to low expectations of their success. So my answer to how we can work within the confines set is that we can't work strictly within them. We have to also work beyond them. And that's that's a tough sell. That's, that's stuffing a lot into what we already have, but we have to help our novice teachers understand and value the multiple sciences that inform how children learn. Thank you, Dr. Dini. We wouldn't have wanted to skip hearing that for sure. <laughs> um, 
Thank you all both. And thanks to all of our panelists for sharing y'all's experiences from your respective vantage points. Now the audience will have the opportunity to ask questions of our panelists and of Dr. Proctor. We've been collecting your questions from the chat and I will turn things over to Rabia who will be moderating the Q&A portion. Rabia? We'll start taking questions, but if you have any questions, please write them in the chat. So looking at the time, I'm thinking that uh, while everyone think about their question and what they um what are the you know the burning questions right now in the, uh, specifically um in each different context because we have here, you know, we're looking at Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut as well. Um, we could um also move to the uh breakout rooms, uh, where you know, through the conversation, I'm pretty sure that many questions will come out. Um, so in, in the interest of time, because we are just at the at the peak of the uh of what we plan to be our breakout group groups, um, we could move there. I agree. I think we should move into our breakout rooms since there are no questions in the chat. Yeah. We're going to compile all the questions. Yeah. So while we, uh, when we come back from the from the bake breaker rooms, we could um, address. We're going to um, uh, classify them and and making sure that um, answer those questions that are similar. So we're going to do some editing. Okay, so we'll change the schedule a little bit. Well, now it's time to go into some breakout rooms to join our colleagues in your state to engage in reflection of today's presentations and participation and to participate in this small group discussion. We're going to be putting groups together, breakout rooms by state. So that's why for those who entered late, we were asking you to write your the initials of your state after your name. Just to let you know that a facilitator has been assigned to each breakout room. The facilitator will share a note-taking document to guide your discussions. The discussion should be centered around the question, this particular guiding question. Although researchers, such as the National Committee for Effective Literacy, have been giving research-based evidence on how biliteracy is developed in multilingual learners, what are the obstacles state departments of education and school districts are facing in implementing their research? With colleagues in the room, we ask that you identify one tension between the research around biliteracy and current policies and practices around the science of reading in your context. The, then end your discussion by identifying possible solutions. And then we'll reconvene in the full group to close out together. And as Maria Luisa said, answer some of the questions that are posted in the chat. Well, it looks like everyone is coming back slowly, but securely. Tell me now that you don't have questions mm -hmm. after such rich conversations in all the breakout rooms. Would you like to go into some of the questions? I have a question. Um, one of the things I um, thought was really beneficial about today was having a combination of stakeholders. So from practitioners to researchers, um, professors, <laughs> Um, folks from um, state agencies. Um, and I'm wondering what um, future opportunities we could have for that, if if anything, because I think it's it's very powerful to have all of those perspectives together because the combined effect um, and combined solutions are are all here. Julie, thank you for that. I mean, that's actually one of the discussions that we had in our uh, small breakout room, that there's a lot of great work happening in silos, but how do we, I mean, even in a small state like Rhode Island, how do we bring people together to communicate and collaborate more? One uh, solution that I heard in my small group was to have lots of, uh, find lots of opportunities to, to speak to people. To leaders at the school level, the district level, all you know, all kinds of stakeholders over and over again, and even utilize Kat Patrick's presentation mm -hmm. as um, information that we're sharing. Mm -hmm. One of the you know solutions that was proposed in our group was to have common uniform PD days like across the state, so teachers can actually in different districts even collaborate and communicate at a regular basis and keep the communication consistent. 
We we have that in had that in Rhode Island. Next year's statewide calendar only has one PD day built in, um, but it was intended to use for the science of reading, which was offered in the way it was. Yeah. So you know, a common uh, trend was also you know, there's time really embedded into the regular schedule to allow teachers to go visit may maybe different schools to collaborate and co-plan and uh, having, you know, uniform uh, schedule embedded into the day-to-day -day teaching, which is difficult with the shortage of teachers. I agree, absolutely. And, and, and on that, also the type of collaboration, I wanted just, just to name that not only among you know, the teachers in dual language, but the reading interventionist and all the other specialists working with the children, because with the students, because we are um, we should have a more holistic approach to the child and not in siloing. So it's like, oh, this is now in, in dual language, in the Spanish class, in the English class, now is this bad kid. It's, you know, it, it it's the same child that we're working with. Mm -hmm. One of the comments that came out from our um, group was to um, transform the the professional development points that every teacher, at least in Massachusetts, need to obtain um, towards the renewal of the license, um, and to have that more specifically, uh, you know, points there on bilingual education. So not any type of uh, PD. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was a common theme in, in our um, breakout room, too. Um, we get a, a, a good um, master class in uh, science of reading, but we need someone to come in and kind of show how that um, should be implemented for multilingual students and all the all the um, the research that really talks about how we have to um, adapt, uh, especially the um, assessments. Um, with things like Dibble's influency being a, such a high risk, a high um, stakes test, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's there's lots of research that talks about um, multilingual learners not um, shouldn't be uh, ha held to the same same time, like they need more time to read. Amy, you have your hand. Yeah, one one thing I I mentioned when I was talking about some things that Connecticut is doing right is allowing that at times as long as you know about the opportunity for the voice of districts to participate in their decisions, sort of, in a kind of way. Um, and one thing we talked about is when that happens, every district is doing the same work, doing the same research, filling out the same rubric, submitting the same thing, and so we could just get together and submit one or make one document and submit it multiple times from multiple districts. Yep. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is as part of the work we're doing with the state, there was really a push to have um, science of reading, sort of somebody to come and teach our administration and our reading interventionists about science of reading. And so they didn't say who, and so we invited um, Alexandra Guilamo to come in for four days to teach us about the science of reading for multilingual learners. Thank you, Amy. Uh, that was also one of the comments in our uh, group too, creating consortium, the consortia of you know, people are doing different PDs, different districts are working with same curricula, but then reinventing the wheel, uh, uh, you know, all the time. So why don't we create a consortia from districts that use the common curricula to share resources, have a hub uh, where they could really exchange and share the wealth. Patrick, you had your hand up. Yeah, so I, I enjoyed all the conversations and looking at the Padlet's super interesting. Th this might be obvious, but I mean, one thing I think that we need to mess message out is that this isn't just a bilingual education issue. This is a bilingualism in education issue. So to the extent that we can be messaging that out, uh, it's super important because the reality is, is that multilingualism is the norm now, and it's only going to be increasingly the norm. So we need to be thinking about how multilingualism is present in all of our classrooms and, and what does that mean for the instruction that we provide and the PD that we do with all of our folks. 
Thank you, Patrick. Aradana, you had your hand up. I did um, before Patrick um, spoke, but I was going to say like, it's now out of order, but I was going to agree with you and uh, Amy Rabia that that was something that came up in our group as well. The, the, the need to spend more time with one another so that we're not all cre recreating the wheel and we're learning from each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess people, especially after COVID, people are really wanting to collaborate, get together, share the wealth. Uh, and training of administrators, uh, just a shout out to our Amy Korea at URI. We actually have an endorsement for MLLs, uh, not for dual language, for MLLs at URI offered now for administrators. So we are uh, hopefully wanting to train more administrators to become knowledgeable on MLL instruction, laws and policies and programs. Okay, any, any other questions or comments that people would like to make? So we'll start to close the meeting. Um, Michael has his hand Michael has, sorry, Mike, I didn't see you. Sorry, Michael. thanks. Good thing we have a lot of observers. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Mike. One thing that we talked about in our group um, was that there are all kinds of areas that we have to uh, advocate um, on behalf of our multilingual learners, assessment, uh, PD, how are we staffing? What kind of international partnerships are we making um, so that we have teachers that can um, can really teach our partner languages? Um, but that advocacy and and we all want to come together and we want to build this capacity together. Um, but we will. We also need to we need to do that and advocate at the state level, at our different state levels, at the national level. We have also have to. And what's going to be really impactful in our spheres of influence is that in any kind of conversation around literacy development, bi-literacy development, what our students really need, we have to bring this up in every single one of those conversations. So we have two more hands up. Maria, thank you, Michael. Maria and Joan. Okay. Hi. Um, I just wanted to um invite us to to think about that. If we look at human history, um, we've always been multilingual and multimodal. And if we look at the United States of America, we've always been multilingual. Um, and so I think we're just at a moment in time that let's recognize those linguistic resources, right? Because um, there have been many native communities that were multilingual and other, um, and certainly the border between Mexico and the United States has crossed the people. And so we've had uh, multilingualism as a reality here. I'd like for us to um, uh, rethink the word systematic. It's so embedded in the science of reading and the curriculum that's attached to it in Massachusetts, apple seeds. I'm not sure if it's going to be um, spilling into the other states and in, in the region. Um, and, and to really think about that, really the kind of teaching we want to be engaged with is situated. Systematic, when we do anything systematically, there's a system and the children go missing. But when we do it situated, then we're really um, working with the children that we're serving. Um, and so moving away from language, much like uh, Patrick uh, had us to uh, did that lovely deconstruction of science, um, you know, and so for us to really keep looking at the ways that these 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 words are creating worlds, and are these the worlds that we want for our children? Thank you, Maria. Joan? Yeah, just very quickly um, to echo everyone's thinking, I would encourage people to really look at the dual language teacher preparation standards so that you can understand how some structures are in place with resources that can sort of spill over into professional learning and into teacher prep. Thank you. Thanks. Phyllis? Okay, I think we're gonna close now for sure because <laughs> we have down, we're down to two minutes. So thank you for all, all of you who are adding things to the Padlet. I just wanted to make sure that you had all this contact information. Um, we are going to take all the information that we're learning from the breakout sessions, from the chats, comments, listening to you in the sharing of this large group debriefing, and we'll use this information to summarize what we've learned today and figure out some next steps. We might actually reach with some of you individually um, as, as ways of helping you or helping us as well deliver this message. So we thank you again for advocating for dual language education programs. Um, we feel it's the most equitable education and language learning program for our students, especially for those in undeserved groups, underserved groups. So once again, thank you for joining us today.